welcome to another episode of Explore, which is Bottom Line Performance's new video blog, video podcast. I don't know what you want to call it, but it is our new video series where we talk about what is new, what is coming in workplace learning. And I'm very excited today. I have Dr. Carl Kopp with me. Hey, Carl, how's it going? Hey, good. How are you doing, Steve? Doing really good. I'm, I'm good. really psyched to be talking to you today and um, talking about learning trends and what's happening in our industry. Um, Carl is a, a researcher, a professor, a speaker, a consultant. I don't know. You do a lot of things, Carl, um, so I can't even keep track of it. What are you up to these days, uh, in, especially in the workplace learning space? Yeah, well, I, I like to keep busy. So um, I'm actually on sabbatical this year, so it's allowed me to do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, working on a new book on micro learning that's going to be out in the fall. Uh, working on a yeah so that should be a good book I'm co-authoring it with one of my fellow students so that's always fun uh, one of my former students I should say um, working on <laughs> working on a peer-reviewed article that I'm hoping will come out this year uh, we've been going back and forth back and forth you know how that goes mm -hmm. and, uh, working on my sabbatical project is creating a virtual uh, game called zombie math apocalypse and so these uh, zombies are going to come out space zombies are going to come after you with math equation on their chest and then you try to solve those math equations. So those are a couple things that I did a board game this spring, which was a lot of fun. So uh, card games going well. So yeah, I've been keeping busy designing games and um, thinking about the future of learning and uh, just kind of uh, really enjoying my time to take deep dives into stuff. Yeah, I, my first exposure to you was reading The Gamification of Learning and Instruction several years ago, and I know you'd written books prior to that on uh, games and gamification and similar topics, and for a while, um, you spoke a lot about that specific area of the learning space. Um, what, what has kind of inspired you to kind of broaden out and, and be looking at things like micro-learning and other trends that are happening in our space? Yeah, that's a good question. So I like to think of myself, you know, as a learning professional first who happens to be interested in games and gamification. And so a lot of my early work actually was about trends and things happening in the space. And then gamification kind of caught on and I kind of kind of rode with that. But I was talking to somebody the other day and she's like, I was telling her, I'd like to look at trends and see how the trends impact, you know, what we're doing in the future. She's like, oh, so you're a futurist. I'm like, well, I don't really think of myself as a futurist. I think of myself as, you know, kind of a researcher and seeing what's out there. And it's kind of like, um, I think it was uh, Gibson wrote, um, he wrote, the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. So I think researcher, I get to look at it and see William Gibson and get to see kind of what's happening. But one of the things that's kind of bothered me about a lot of the predictions in our field and a lot of the focus in our field, they'll say, you know, next year is the year of AI or it's the year of, you know, uh, mobile. But to me, that's not really a trend. That's a technology. The trend is that we're going to have uh, coaches in our pocket that are technology enabled that are going to help us be better leaders or better presenters. So to me, the trend really is toward behaviorally focused digital apps, not toward, you know, mobile learning or micro learning. So I think we really need to think about, let's not focus on the technology of these so-called trends. Let's talk about what's converging and what that means for us. So for example, you know, you have this trend of micro learning, right? But what it's really about is giving small, precise, accurate learning just in time. So maybe we should focus on that. It's it's harder to encapsulate all that in one word, but yeah. micro learning works. But really, we're not about micro learning, right? We're about helping people perform better at the time of need. That should be the trend, mm -hmm. not micro learning. Maybe it's that learning professionals are just getting new tools that can help them do that better, which is really what the focus should have been on all along. Would you say? Maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the focus really should have been on, it should always be on the outcome first. Like, what do we want from this learning event? And so um, that is a little bit more complicated than saying, oh, here's a new technology. Let's figure out where it goes or let's figure out what it needs to uh, uh, be associated with. So, for example, when the iWatch came out, which I saw today, which is fascinating. So 
Apple is now the largest watch manufacturer in the world, bigger mm -hmm. than Switzerland, which I think is amazing. But when it first came out, people said, oh, let's do iWatch learning. And I'm like, what problem are we solving with this iWatch learning? So I think we really exactly need to start at the, at the problem or the behavior that we want to change. So for example, working with this one company called Present R, it's the word present in the lowercase mm -hmm. r, and they have an app that coaches you in how to be a better presenter. It actually tracks the number of verbal interrupts, like the ums and ahs, or as you know, and gives you feedback. It gives you feedback on your pacing and your volume. So, but it's not really about the technology. It's about having this coach that's going to monitor your behavior, give you feedback on your behavior, and help you be better. So, I think we really need to think about. So, when people say AI is the you know the future of learning, I'm like, what? What? What is this AI? Like, what do you mean AI? Do you mean like the Terminator AI? Do you mean like how AI from 2001? Or do yeah. you mean, you know, this chat bot that's going to interact with me and help me think through this problem? So then the really the learning needs to be about thinking through problems and how do we do that? So we need to get better at breaking tasks apart, making them into specific algorithms, and then figuring out how do you teach that algorithm? Maybe it's with AI, maybe it's with, one-to-one -one coaching, maybe it's just a job aid. So mm -hmm. we really can't get caught up in the technologies in the converges. Now, certainly technology enables us to do a lot of stuff that we haven't been able to do before or scale at a level that we have not been able to do before. But I think we need to be careful. Like, so for example, you know, everybody's all over VR, VR. I'm like, well, okay, so what's the app, right? What's the killer app for VR? It's kind of like, you know, it was fascinating to me. Um, Microwaves have been out for uh, like a long, long time, but they never really caught on mm -hmm. until they created the killer app, which was microwavable popcorn. As soon as microwavable popcorn was created, people went nuts for microwaves. That was the killer app of microwaves. So mm -hmm. we need to think about, you know, if you have AI, what's the killer learning app for AI that's going to make it make sense for us as professionals rather than just chasing after AI? I get what you're saying. It, it's like there's an extra layer to it where we'll see it in the marketing world or the consumer world where these trends start to play out. But in order for it to be used for workplace learning, it actually, there's that extra piece where it needs to be enabling performance or enabling learning. And there's the corporate, how do we scale up? How do we adopt this technology? Uh, it may the expense involved and what have you. Do you see that happen where we kind of will have that maybe almost like a, a much longer than anticipated delay between the buzz and the excitement around something like AI and the adoption in the corporate space. Yeah, I definitely think so. That's a really good observation because what, what happens is it's easier to come out with the technology first, right? We've got this AI or we've got a micro learning that we can deliver, you know, right to your phone whenever you need it. But it's harder to say, well, how is this really going to impact this organization, these people in this organization, and how's it gonna make their job easier, better, faster, more proficient, whatever that happens to be. And so that extra layer takes a lot of work and a lot of focus on how do you do that correctly. So for, for example, gamification, it was this thing, oh, we'll add points badge and leaderboard and everybody will be happy. Mm -hmm. That's not how, you know, yeah, that's that not works, how it works. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, the points have to be meaningful, they have to give feedback, they have to be, um, all kinds of things. So uh, we, it's the easy step to just look at the technology and just predict the technology. The harder but more valuable step is to say, okay, what layer do we add on top of micro learning, gamification, uh, AI, AR to make it really effective? And what affordances does VR have that, for example, 2D, traditional e-learning, what, what does it not have that an immersive VR environment brings to the table? So we as learning professionals really need to think about it at a much more strategic level. I think the technology to me is tactical, but really we want to think strategically. You know, everybody talks about sitting at the table and all that kind of stuff. Well, you can't just sit up at the table and say, hey, I got this great AI, let me implement AI, right? Unless you're an AI company. But if you're in learning and development, it's not about AI. It's about how do our managers make better decisions? How do we 
teach our brand new VP to think at the enterprise level, not the department level, right? Those are the real issues that we need to deal with as learning and development professionals. That's absolutely right. I love what you're saying. Given that, given the fact that learning and development professionals have to be concerned with that extra layer, so to speak, beyond just the technology or the hype, what are some of the trends that you see where that layer or that pathway to clearly impacting performance is defined enough that the trends are, are really ready to make an impact uh, in the learning space? Yeah, that's a good question. So first of all, I don't think, um, you know, uh, figure, so figuring out, so for example, if we take our best salesperson, we might say, oh, our, our salesperson, let's do some VR sales training. So we'll have these virtual sales meetings that we can have and we'll train everybody how to do that. But if you don't take the step and say, okay, we have our best salesperson, how do we dissect what she does that is so different and so much better than the rest of her sales force? So we need to know like task analysis. We need to break down what she's doing, looking at her behaviors, looking at how often she does things and then take those elements and add them to the VR. But if we just say, let's add VR for sales practice, we're not really getting to that level of what makes a difference. So we as learning and development um, professionals, in order to catch these trends for our, for our organization or level the, leverage these technologies for our organization, really need to think about breaking down tasks. And it's so funny, when I first started graduate school, we did these painful task analysis documents and mm -hmm. one, one famous one was always how do you change a tire? And so you do that and then like, well, you forgot to mention, you know, go get the lug nuts or something. So now the tires on there and there's no lug nuts, right? Oh, and you forget how detailed you have to be, but you know, that's kind of fallen out of favor a little bit. And so I really think that we as L and D professionals need to, you know, go back to our, you know, the, the trends are back to our roots a little bit. Task analysis, I think it's going to be a huge trend. Performance analysis is going to be a huge trend in terms of what we're able to do. And I think ability, so if you think of like uh, all the analytics, right? Analytics is always, you know, that's the future of learning, right? Well, what do you do with the analytics? Mm -hmm. so with one organization, I, I created this really nice dashboard and she goes, um, and, and had red, green, and yellow for like what's, you know, and she came back to me and she said, um, the trainers don't know how to interpret the dashboard. I'm like, okay, well, yellow means, you know, people aren't doing that well, but they're not horrible. Red means horrible. Green means they're okay. She's like, no, no, no. But once you interpret it, how do you coach to that? How do you train to that? So it's not enough to say, oh, we're going to have learning analytics. We have to say, okay, what do you do with the results of the learning analytics? So interpreting and then acting on the results, I think is a trend that's coming up as well. We now have all this data, but we don't always know how, what the data is telling us or how to react to that data. I think what you're getting at, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that if we think about what a performance consultant or an instructional designer, which has always been after, which has been analyzing performance, really understanding the tasks breakdown of what somebody needs to do to be successful, being able to design the right solution, being able to report and, and have evidence that, that that change has occurred, that maybe that becomes the filter for evaluating these different technologies that are coming out. Um, would you agree with that assessment? And if so, um, or if not, what do you think, what would be your recommendation to a learning professional who's trying to look out there in the landscape and, and look at different options and, and decide what they should be integrating into their programs? Right. So I, th I think two things. First of all is you definitely have to have that understanding of task analysis, performance analysis, what the end goal is. And second, I would, I would argue, look internally first. Okay. Where are the problems internally and then look for solutions, whether they're technology-based solutions or not technology-based solutions. Don't go out and look for a technology, look for a solution. And I think a lot of um, what has happened in the L and D field is um, you'll get really smart techie people that don't know much about L and D and they'll create this really cool like niche product. They think it's a cool niche product. 
and they'll sell it from the technology perspective. Like here's AI, this AI can do this, and this AI can do this, and this AI can do that. Yeah, but my problem really is how do my customer service reps at the call center have an intelligent conversation with somebody who's upset, right? That's really the problem. Mm -hmm. And so AI might solve that, but what you're really looking for is a solution based around conflict resolution, understanding your customer, first call fixes, those kind of things. So I really think that it makes a lot of sense to look at your problems internally, your performance problems, and then look for solutions. And I really think the technology should be the second thing mentioned, not the first thing mentioned, right? The, sec the first thing should be, here's you know, a call center solution. Oh, and by the way, it happens to be AI empowered or AI enhanced or something like that. So I would look for vendors that talk about solutions first and technology second. That's absolutely right. And kind of going back to something you said earlier, that the future is already here, but it's not evenly distributed. For those that are really curious about separating the buzz from the reality with VR and AI and things like this, do you have one or two examples you could share where one of these solutions that maybe is currently considered more cutting edge in quotes actually was the best and right solution to solve that performance challenge? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So, um, so yeah, so, um, working with a large pharmaceutical company and they are, um, switching kind of a sales model and they want to, their reps to really understand how to have conversations with their, um, healthcare providers. And what, one of the things that they've done is we've actually made an immersive environment for them to feel like they're on a call. And um, it's, it's VR, and now we have like a bunch of people in the office and uh, people you know, bothering the receptionist just like they are so that they feel that hustle and bustle so they get a sense of kind of the tension. And then they get to hear that conversation. We're using a text-to-speech and we're using a, a virtual um, avatar environment. And so those are cutting edge, but the reason why we chose those is because we wanted the rep to feel what it's like to be in that environment when you're not, you know, on, in the e-learning module, it's just me and the text and I can stop and take a drink of water or look away. There's no problem. But when I'm actually talking to the receptionist, trying to get an appointment with the healthcare provider, it's crazy, right? There's patients that need to be there. There's a receptionist who's, you know, maybe looking at pictures of their son's uh, soccer match on their phone. <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of things going on and it's not this, pure environment where you can act in. So we purposely chose an immersive environment like that to make it really kind of hectic and really kind of busy. And so now the rep gets uh, experience kind of working in that environment. And it turns out, this is fascinating to me, I've been doing some research on things called, a uh, thing called desirable difficulty and recall of content. And it turns out, you know, we learned when we were growing up, at least I did, to study, you had to be in a quiet space. You study at the same place every day. Nobody bothers you. And that's how you study and then apply the, the content. Turns out that's a horrible way to study because you do really good on the test. But what, what you won't be able to do is recall that information under difficult or different situations because you only learned it under one situation. Yeah. You only reinforced it under one situation. So the technology in that particular case like I can immediately change up the office in this 3D virtual environment. And now it's something totally different. I can make it quiet. I can make it loud. I can make it hectic. I can have somebody come in with an emergency. I can have, we, we kind of made a game version where you have these like uh, creatures come in and bother you because you have that sense of elevated tension. So you can do all kinds of things with that technology that you couldn't do with like a video, you didn't have to shoot like 50 videos or that one-on-one -on -one learning. And so that's an example of using kind of cutting edge technology, that virtual reality technology to uh, meet specific outcomes and goals, which is how do you perform in kind of a crazy hectic environment? So that, that's one example. That's a really good example. I think that's a great use case for why virtual reality is something that so many of us are, are watching with great interest as the technology develops. I think you gave a great example earlier about 
uh, analytics and the importance of learning analytics and how data is really going to be and the availability of that data really changes what's possible. Are there any other trends that you um, either expect to see or maybe uh, something you really would just hope to see uh, being added to the tool belt for learning professionals over the next three to five years? Yeah, so I see. So I think I think VR um, is going to be a niche uh, trend. I think augmented reality is going to definitely uh, be leaps and bounds because when you can put work procedures or instructions on top of a piece of equipment, an engine, a motor, anything like that, I think that's going to be game changing. We just had we our power was out. I think yesterday for thirteen hours, fourteen hours. Um, and you know the emergency crews had to come out and figure out what's going on and all that kind of stuff. But could you imagine if they had all that information in a contact lens? Because it's not going to be glasses; it's going to be contact lens and a little computer in your pocket, and it's going to be able to give you the data about that particular transformer. What is wrong with that transformer? What it should look like? What the schematics look like? Where the equipment is? Where the wires are? So I think augmented reality is definitely. Uh, going to be a game changer for learning and development. Now, the serious augmented reality people tell me, you know, that's still going to be like five, six, maybe seven years out till we get it kind of perfect. And if you think of the Gartner hype cycle, we're probably near the top of hype for right. augmented reality. And then we're going to fall in the trough of disillusionment. We're all going to be upset. Augmented reality is not going to save the world. And we're going to have to but then we're going to have this slope of enlightenment and the plateau productivity. We're actually going to see the results of it. And that, that's the other thing to think about technology is, I mean, there are um, some companies who haven't heard, who think e-learning is like revolutionary, right? So there are lots of opportunities for us to be really intelligent about solving the problems of our clients or customers, internal or external, without this, this leading edge stuff. I also think that, um, sensor-based instruction is going to be really kind of uh, important in the future. It was hmm. hyped there for a while, and then it kind of went away. So I always say, look for the hype stuff that's gone away. That's going to at some point break through and really kind of be uh, successful. Not in every case, uh, but in many cases, that kind of kind of um, technology um, invisibility kind of comes back up there. Like so, Google Glass, for example it kind of went away from mainstream, but there are fa plenty of factories where every employee has Google Glass and they're using it for work instructions and that kind of stuff. So those kind of things I think are gonna be around. And I think um, the other thing that is gonna be really uh, helpful is gonna be these, those behavior apps that I talked about. There's gonna be one, for, there's already one for leadership, there's one for presenting, there's one for running meetings, you know, all of those kind of technologies are going to help us do a little bit better. And it's going to be, it's, it's fascinating. There's going to, uh, I was reading something the other day about um, managers are managing more and more by exception and by uh, triggers and alerts from systems. And you, we're going to have to learn as, as humans to, I mean, there's going to be a huge human trend, I think. But we're going to have to learn how to read and interpret that for our human interface. So how do you, if somebody's dealing with data all day and then they have to go talk to their employee who's having a bad day or is coming late or whatever, those are different, fundamentally different skill sets, right? People that are really good at data aren't often really good at some of the HR, warm and fuzzy, empathy type of things. So there's going to be a huge need there. Um, this is kind of a joke, but someone was telling me one time, uh, they went up to an intern and said, how do you like your new job? And she goes, I hate it. The boss makes me speak in full sentences and make eye contact, right? So, <laughs> That's right, yeah. Right, exactly. But um, so what's missing? So that skill, so, so as L&D professionals, it's, it's so funny, we're simultaneously dealing with this you know, huge rush of technology, but also, rehumanizing the learning and development process so that we don't lose what fundamentally gives us an advantage over you know a robot or a machine or something like that it's going to be very interesting i 
so I've, I just started jotting down notes as you were going because so many good points there. I, we've seen that rise in soft skills uh, requests and interests. And on our own learning trends survey, we've seen the rise in soft skills training. Your comment about um, looking for the technologies that maybe have gone away and then come back um, kind of made me chuckle. I was thinking about some of the rudimentary early attempts at things like Second Life. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you think about where that was and the interest that was around that uh, years ago. And, and now we're seeing that VR is making sense in some of these more niche use cases. And AR even makes me laugh a little bit thinking of QR codes all grown up, right? <laughs> so guess. no more, we don't need the QR code because we'll have the contact lens and we can just look at stuff and get that information you know, in the future. Um, so I, those were all great examples. Um, yeah. I, I want to uh, shift gears just a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about um, some of what you've been doing over at lynda.com because I've been very interested and I've enjoyed seeing some of the content that you've put together for them. Um, Tell us a little bit about some of the, the courses that you've done at Lynda and, and what do you like about creating educational content for kind of the, the MOOC media? Yeah, so it's really kind of, kind of interesting. Just real quick, I, I wrote a book several years ago called Learning in 3D with uh, Tony O'Driscoll. We co-wrote it. It was all about Second Life and all that. And I always joke yes. that you can track the death of Second Life to about the day that book came out. But the fascinating thing to me- <laughs> You were on that trend. <laughs> I was totally on that trend, yeah. Um, but the really fascinating thing to me is, and I keep wanting to do this, but all the same concepts and ideas that are in those virtual worlds are in virtual reality, right? We just need to like do that. And, and it was so funny because one of the, one of the things that made me write that book was the first experience I had, I went into a virtual classroom, sat at a virtual chair and saw a virtual PowerPoint. And a lot of VR experiences are just like that. I'm like, that's not the experiences we want to recreate recreate an experience where you're a uh, first responder and you're at an emergency or someone has just collapsed or, you know, those kind of things. Um, so like any one of these subjects I could talk like forever, but so the lynda.com courses now LinkedIn learning uh, are really um, I've done a number. I've done several on gamification, just did one on gamification of sales. So thinking about how to do that correctly and did one on learning and development as a competitive advantage. So what do you need to think about if you really want learning and development to be a competitive advantage for your company, not just um, for something that you have to do or compliance or whatever. And the process to me is really interesting because it's, it's not, I just uh, read another study by a gentleman. He said uh, he looked at, I think 6.9 million instances of TEDx, um, no, TED Ed, TED Ed videos. And he made conclusions. So one of the conclusions he made was, Never ever take classroom instruction, like somebody in front of a classroom, chop that up and make that into learning bits. And uh, LinkedIn Learning doesn't do that at all. Basically what they do, it's more like a one-on-one -on -one mentorship or conversation. So there's me as an instructor looking at the camera, which is the learner, and really talking to them about what they need to do. So when we think about you know, online uh, learning or the video learning format, what we really wanna think about is, an instructor having a one-to-one -one conversation or relationship with the learners. And if you think about the best possible training environment ever is the journeyman and their apprentice, because the journey, uh, journey person could go on and if the apprentice was a little slow, the journey person would slow down. If the apprentice was fast, they'd give them more stuff. If the apprentice messed up, they'd have them reflect on what they messed up and do it better. And it was this one-on-one -on -one consulting and coaching, which was really hard to scale. But the courses where there's you directly talking to the learner, I think allows that scalability. It's not ideal um, because, you know, it'd be great if we were shoulder to shoulder. But the next best thing with technology is I, I can take a course. Like, so I get um, free the LinkedIn learning courses because I'm uh, an author and so um, I can take courses and have from like people all over the world, which is fantastic, who I would never have exposure to before. Um, so I, I've done a number of courses there, some on set, some with a green screen. They give me some really cool offices that I would like to have for real. Yeah, I thought those were all your offices. So yeah. that's news to me. <laughs> right. Yeah, Oprah Winfrey collects houses, I collect offices. Yeah, so, you have several, yeah. Uh, only on the green screen. So, but it's really cool. So, so, but it's a different kind of instruction. And 
the thing that fascinated me was, you know, I always ask them, you know, how am I doing? You know, they're like, good, good, good. I'm like, well, um, uh, do people struggle? And they're like, yes, because they're talk maybe too formally, right? So they're really kind of formal in their delivery or they're too stiff behind the camera or they're not providing the value in the content. They're just talking at a really kind of high level. So to do those courses is a lot more work and a lot more targeted delivery than I initially had thought. Um, you really kind of have to write and, and they've, they've done a lot of research. So, you know, before I was having, you know, some uh, eight, nine minute um, videos and I'm like, no, no, no. They have to be like, you know, no longer than like four or five minutes. You got to be really tight on the video. You've got to make sure that you hit the main point. So it's really kind of, a science of how you deliver instruction, video-based instruction to meet the need. And then of course, one pushback that everybody gives me is, you know, I'm, I'm teaching a course on gamification and interactivity and all that. And they're like, well, that's not in your course. Like you're talking about gamification and you're not doing any in your course. Um, but the medium doesn't particularly allow that, but what it does allow is that intimacy. So I think we can make up a lot, getting back to the you know comment about humanity. I think we can make up a lot of, connection with people through those kind of one-on-one -on -one discussions and humanity and making it warm and personal. We don't always, you know, if you think about your best instructor, it wasn't always, you know, you're totally interactive and totally doing something. That instructor connected with you on a human level. And that's why the learning was so exciting. I mean, you go back and you look at people that have had great discoveries they go oh yeah i got interested in history because i had this history teacher in third grade that was just so engaging and the stories were so or i had a philosophy because my philosophy professor was so so that kind of connection we can't ignore that we and and if it's done well on video you can make that kind of connection which i think is kind of exciting so that's why i like to do those those courses and that's that's really the same reason why we've been loving this video format for these type of conversations. It, it's kind of the same basic premise. I mean, the fact, speaking of a trend, right? The fact that we can jump on a tool, click a link, hit record, export a video, load it to YouTube within, you know, a few minutes and have it out there and people can watch this and interact. It's, that is something that I think has really been a shift that I've noticed the last few years is how the video tools, the compression tools, the, the internet speeds, all of that is enabling this new type of connection, whether you're watching a Linda course or watching a, a video podcast conversation. And I think that there are a lot of exciting implications there for learning professionals. Oh yeah, there, there's a ton. So I, I find it fascinating. So, you know, our son is away, he's in New York and um, we call, he calls once a week. And the difference between talking to him on the phone and FaceTiming him is night and day. So it's one thing to have, you know, a disembodied conversation and we know what our son looks like. You know, we live with them for several years. Uh, he knows what we look like, but just having that visual. And I think you're absolutely right. This is really, it's the Jetsons come to life. Yes, it is. I'm going to get in my flying car after this. So Right, exactly. Well, we're not there yet, but we're getting, so, but I think that's really kind of cool that we can do this. And I think it adds a, a sense of intimacy. Um, I wrote, um, uh, another book, but you reminded me of all these, but, but gadgets, games, and gizmos for learning, like way back when. Mm -hmm. um, and in one of the, in that book, which by the way, is my favorite book. It's a little dated now, but it's my favorite one that I wrote. Um, I talk about uh, Batman, uh, the new Batman, how Bruce Wayne is very old. He's in the Batcave, but he's giving instructions because he can see through the eyes of his surrogate, you know, Batman who is fighting crime and, and Bruce Wayne, the older Bruce Wayne has all the knowledge and ideas, but the youth has the energy and the strength and that kind of stuff. And I think that's kind of, we can now have an expert really be kind of anywhere and coach a lot of different people and help a lot of different people. Um, and it's very scalable and video makes things scalable, which I think is really exciting. And I remember when the World Wide web first came out, video was like poor, like it was painful to watch. <laughs> when you downloaded it and I read somewhere somebody said no matter how painful video is no matter how choppy it is master video on the web because that will be the future and he was absolutely right like, here we are right so it's kind of like that with new technologies right yeah VR is a little clunky yeah AR is not quite there yet you know um, sensors don't really sense everything that they should sense 
doesn't matter. Get to understand that. Like I always say, find a technology um, for your hobby. And when you do that technology as your hobby, when that technology makes it, whatever that happens to be, then you're going to be prepared to do that and solve problems that you're working on because technology is now ready for it. Totally. So um, it's, we're a few months out, so I imagine you don't know quite yet, or you probably know, but you, I know from speaking uh, that you're, you're going to, you take some time to put it all together, but uh, we're really excited to have you coming to our XLearn conference this September as one of our keynote speakers. Um, we're just, our conversation today has kind of been around some of the topics that I think you're going to be talking about, but maybe tell us a little bit about um, what, you're, what you're planning to share with um, attendees at XLearn. Yeah, so I'm really excited to be out there and really excited to be part of the conference. So thanks for, for that. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm going to try to talk about what to look for when you look for trends. Um, I'm going to talk about the convergence of several different things that point to a trend. I'm going to talk about a little bit how you find those lines of convergence how you think about those lines of convergence. Because kept in the back of my mind, every time I'm talking about the new technology, I'm thinking, okay, how about Bernoulli drives, right? They went away. How about beta um, tapes? They went away. So technology does change, and sometimes you can bet on the wrong technology. So I'm going to talk about ways that you can kind of bet on the right technology and where do some of those converging lines lead us as L&D professionals, both from the uh, technology perspective, but also from the... Uh, practice perspective. When I when I first started in instructional um, technology, there wasn't a whole lot of computers or technology. So I finally kind of smart ass said to my professor one time, I'm like, where's the technology? Like, what what is this instructional technology? He said, technology in our definition is the systematic approach and scientific explanations that we apply to learning. And I thought, Oh my gosh, that's, that's a great definition of technology because the tools will change, but having that scientific approach, having that systematic approach is what allows us to adapt to the new technologies out there. So I'm going to be talking about that as well um, out there as well. Well, guys, I stand corrected. Carl's ready to go. We're four and a half months out. <laughs> He's got it ready to rock. So, Carl, I'm going to close this out. This has been a fantastic conversation. We've got uh, five questions that we've been asking everybody who's been joining us on these videos. So I'm going to, I'm going to fire away. Uh, okay. Our first question here, a person you love to follow on social media. Okay, so uh, this is a little um, self-serving, but one of my former students, Melissa Milloway, if you're in like the L&D department of any organization, she is an expert at working out loud. She works at Amazon, but she, her weekends, her evenings are creating e-learning projects and experimenting with e-learning tools and then talking about her experimentation and what went right and what didn't go right. So I think Melissa Milloway is a, is a fantastic person to follow. So I definitely recommend her. Totally agree on that one. Uh, what about a great piece of advice that you have received? So um, someone... <laughs> Someone once told me, um, you can never find time, you can only make time. And I thought that was like really good advice. Like, don't try to find time to do this. If you think it's important, make time to do this because it's important. You're never gonna find the time. So I thought that was really kind of, that was a helpful piece of advice. And then, uh, um, yeah, I think that's helpful. I, that, I can't hear that enough. That's, I like that one too. So biggest lesson learned in business. So, uh, uh, things will always change. Like no matter what your vision is, once it meets the needs of the customer, that's going to change. Um, so, uh, always listen to the voice of the customer, always kind of get what their ideas are, um, have some idea of what you want to do, but, but it will be shaped by the customer and that's okay. Listen to the customer, listen to what the customer is telling you and then, adapt appropriately. So, so other than, um, other than copnotes.com and bottomlineperformance.com, what is a favorite website or blog that you have related to learning and development? Okay. So this isn't exactly related, but I love uh, the stuff by Tom Peters. Um, some of it might be a little bit, you know, old, but his website, he has got all kinds of resources on there and all kinds of ideas. And he talks in, you know, quick pithy little, uh, phrases, but sometimes they really resonate. So 
uh, I remember one he he put on there. Um, it was by uh, uh, Mario Andretti, and he said, you know, if everything seems under control, you're just not going fast enough. And I thought, like, talk about business. What a great, yeah. you know, like, like, yeah, you feel like everything should be under control, but then you're not really doing what you should be doing. So um, Tom Peters is definitely a place I would look for resources and blogs and things like that. If you're new to the e-learning field and, and you kind of want e-learning recommendation, you know, Connie Malad's the e-learning coach, I think is a great yep. uh, place to go. Really good information there. Um, so those are a couple different, different places that I like to stop by and take a peek. All right. So finally, tell us an app that you can't live without. Okay, so I, this is, might be cheating, but um, <laughs> it's, it's, a game it's, fine. it's a game app. Okay, so it's definitely Plants vs. Zombies 2. And uh, I'm like addicted to that particular game. Like literally, I play it every morning because uh, they're so smart. They have a, every day they have a, like a challenge. And if you do this challenge five days in a row, then you get this pinata and you get more prizes and stuff like that, which is all virtual. It means nothing, but it's really smart in terms of pulling me into that. So that's, that's an app I use <laughs> literally every day. Well, there you have it, guys. Carl Kopp is walking the talk when it comes to games and gamification. He is a true uh, lover of games, um, but also of all things uh, um, trends and technology. And I really like how you tied it all back to performance and what we're really all here for uh, to begin with. So thank you so much for, for joining us, Carl. Thanks, Steve. No, it was great talking to you, and I can't wait to see you in uh, September. Absolutely. Hopefully sooner. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so um, the XLearn conference, uh, September 5th in Indianapolis, the pre-conference workshop on design thinking and applying that to learning and development is on September 4th. We hope you can join us and we hope you'll tune in for our next one of these BLP Explore videos. Thanks so much.